stage of um, the summer school is about expanding on your impact pitches that you've developed and creating a more comprehensive investment pitch. Um, now that's of particular relevance for the six people who, 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 have, um, who are in the, uh, the boot camp because they will be presenting to a panel of um, industry and venture capital uh, experts on Thursday at 2 o'clock their investment pitches and again there will be prizes and the potential to actually get some investment to prototype um, their technology. Um, and the way that we uh, got about doing this is to invite in some experts. So um, at the back of the hall here, we've got Mark Riley, hand up, Mark Riley, who comes from IP Group, who will be talking about software business models in, in some detail um, afterwards, uh, after me. And we've got Peter Thornley from Kilburn and Stroh, now Captain Attorneys, who will be talking to you quite some detail about intellectual property with particular relevance to software, is that? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But I'm, um, I'm the warm-up act for them, really, in a sense. Um, I'm going to give you, first you know, a little bit about what QMI does, what technology transfer is about, and then I'm going to move on to what you need to incorporate in an investment pitch, I'll give you a, a proposed structure. Um, and then I'm going to actually give you an example of, of a successful investment pitch um, for you to, um, to have a look at and, and, and take, take notes from and, and, and hopefully take some tips for your own investment pitches. So I want to see the six in one, I want to see you noting like crazy. <coughs> right. So just, just a little bit of background on us, we're Queen, Queen Mary Innovation, Pushka who's just left. He's, he's part of the team, the technology engineering team. We've got nine staff, there are two in technology engineering, two be sitting in the biopharma team, and then five support staff, which sounds a lot, but um, there we go, I suppose there are key functions that we need to cover in our job, like contracts, very important, and the patenting side of things, which is also very important. Um, yeah, and so QMI is fundamentally about something which is called technology transfer. So as the name suggests, you've got a technology and you're trying to transfer it somewhere, and usually that's into industry or a spin-out company, to create some, some value. And just, just when you talk about technology, you talk about transferring something, you've got to actually transfer something to someone, and that something is nearly always um, based on a substantial piece of intellectual property. Now, I'm not even going to pretend that I'm as, as, as well versed as Peter up there in the, uh, in the world of intellectual property, so I won't steal any of his thunder, but I thought I'd just kind of overview quickly what are the different types of intellectual property um, which we, we've dealt with in our office, licensed, uh, and many of you will be familiar with, with patents, you've probably heard about Apple and Samsung fighting pattern wars and all these sorts of things. And they are probably the, the most substantial, substantial and tangible piece of, of intellectual property. Um, Peter is really the expert on that. We also have things such as know-how, which tend to be trade secrets, which are I suppose, magic recipes, maybe Coca-Cola formula, a hidden Coca-Cola formula, which, which, which they kept secret all these years. You have copyright, which can, can cover written work, music, sound, and software, which is, which is the key one, obviously, for this, this group of people. We have design rights, so when the car is designed, they will, they will find a whole bunch of design rights in about the shape and look of the car. Database rights become, obviously, more important as, as, as databases have taken off in the last few years. And then finally, you'll be familiar with trademarks which all the major companies will have uh, protection around. So in terms of, of what you do with that intellectual property, once you, you've ring-fenced it, you uh, can either license it onto a third party, which means that you retain ownership 
and you give them some rights, usually in a particular field, either exclusively or not exclusively, to actually go off and produce products based upon that intellectual property. Um, you, can, you can actually sell, essentially, assign the intellectual property to a third party so that they become the legal owner of that. And sometimes there's something called a revenue share where you would get some some form of future revenues from that, but, but usually it's just a one-off fee for the purchase. Or you can form a spin-out or start-up company, um, which is usually funded by, by venture capital. Um, that is Mark's domain, um, Life Improved, so he'll be able to maybe give you an overview about that as well during this talk. And that's usually, um, once you've got your start-up company, Sort of services or products, and plans to get some sort of exit where you would make some money so that the shareholders would, would get some, some back to the investment they put in. As I said, licensing, obviously based upon um, intellectual property. Um, usually there's been a substantial uh, body of, of, of work that's, that's gone on to, to demonstrate that you can do what you say you think you can do in a patent or, or uh, some other form of intellectual property. As I say, it's either non-exclusively or exclusively by <laughs> field. So obviously non-exclusively means that you can license it on to a number of different people. Um, and usually there's a significant amount of further development for licenses to undertake at their cost. So the risk uh, is usually quite substantially on, on the licensee. Uh, in our field, technology and engineering, the licensing fees and, and royalties are generally quite low. We hear about large licensing fees in the royalties in the farmer industry, but the markets that we deal with tend to be, tend to be quite niche. Is that pretty new, sorry? Sorry? Is that pretty new? Then okay, to uh, it, Well, yeah, I mean, it, it would be, potentially if it's, a, if it's a royalty, then yeah, it would be lifetime of the pattern we receive that that lot. Um, we've got one where it's, it's like a 90k mm -hmm. um, but we're not talking mm -hmm. billions and millions and millions and millions and millions that you can get from big big drug um, patents when they, they obviously go to billion pound markets. <laughs> but you know there's a different kind of risk profile there so so we do a lot of smaller value Whereas our biopharma team will do one, maybe high value one, at some point in the future. They haven't done one yet, but, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's a kind of balance of risk. Uh, and as, as it's, it's one of the common themes throughout, throughout the world, most, most people tend to be slightly risk averse. Um, so usually there needs to be some substantial uh, POC, proof of concept, uh, development of the technology before someone would actually license it. And that's all of relevance here, of course, because potentially at the end of this, one or a number of the six people who are in the, uh, the boot camp could actually get some funding, proof concept funding, to deliver their, their idea a bit further. You know, company gain, IP, either licensed or assigned across to the company, this is very general, it's not always the case, but sometimes it's a platform technology, so you can go into lots of different markets, you want to focus on a particular niche market in the first instance, get there, prove it out, and then hopefully kind of expand across in, into a bigger market, into more you know, different markets. Uh, usually venture capital investment, increasingly because of various tax incentive schemes, you're getting the angels who will to invest, so high net worth individuals, usually people who've kind of done it before, got a bit of experience, got some money behind them, and the government basically allows them to make essentially free bets on, on, on early stage technology and tax incentives. You always need some external management to come in, so I don't think there's ever been a case I don't know of, and I'm sure Mark will confirm this where an academic is actually become a CEO and, and led a company. I mean, it's all horses for courses, academics are great at, at doing research. Um, and people who've been 
16 years of companies and have gone through that process and have executed and made lots of money, they're good at that. And so it's a bringing together of, of those two sort of skills that really makes a successful spin out company. It'll usually go through a, a number of, of funding rounds as the value of, of the actual spin out company increases and the potential to go into to global markets becomes, becomes possible. And the final thing that all the shareholders want is either some sort of exit through a trade sale or through an IPO, so that would be floating on usually the A market, first of all, so the alternative investment market. Um, and typically, this is just a rough, rough figure. Um, you can get about 10 million coming back to the university and the inventors at the end of that process. So it might be that it's a trade sale for 200 million, but because of all the investment that's gone in, the percentage shares that the university and the investors have obviously reduces. But typically, it's around 10 million at the end of that process. But they are, I mean, don't get too excited, there are very few um, and far between. So just a little bit of a table here, just to give you some comparison between the two different... Oh, question? Yeah. Um, what, uh, roughly, in percentage, what's the, the share between the inventor and the university? Currently. So, so there's, a, so there's a, a policy document that says that the share between the university and, and the inventors is 60-40, 60 going to the university and 40 going to the inventors. That, that figure is, is currently under review, the whole IP policy is currently under review. Um, and I believe there's going to be a new IP policy coming in September. So, the new policy to increase the passion uh, towards the university or towards the inventors? Towards the inventors. So, just a quick, quick overview, you can read this as well, I can, but you know, spin outs tend to be high value, they also tend to be high, high risk, so I don't know what the stats are, but probably. The hundred actually actually make it through the exit. The spin up company you have quite a lot of control. Because when, you, when you license it across, when you license it once you cross, you obviously lose that control. The importance of human capital is extremely high for, for spin up companies. Obviously, it's high for, for, for the license because it's not part of that really. Um, again, it's a I say less mature, more mature. You know, I think generally speaking, it needs to be slightly more mature for licensing. Um, and the ongoing support, you know, we as a university take more, have to spend more time on our spin outs than we do managing our, our licenses. And this, this is um, just some thoughts on what's an obvious market, what is an obvious license, and what is an obvious spin out. If you have a, a mature market where there are a number of large players in that market, it would be very difficult for a spin-out company to break into that market. So usually those types of technology are, 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 are good for, for licensing on the big players who already have the customers, they have the distribution networks, and then you would just never ever as a spin-out company be able to get, get close to, to, to competing with them. As I say, usually the technology is mature with one sort of application, so not, not so much of a sort of platform. And there are a number of examples there as well. Um, for a spin-out, well, I mean, it's kind of a strange thing, is that it requires significant capital <laughs> to really risk it before the commercial take-up. But yeah, I mean, that, that can be the situation, you know, you can be caught that no one will want to actually uh, license the technology until you have actually proved it out, until you've done what it says on the tin. And there are a number of, 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 of examples of, of successful spin out companies where they invested some money, proved out the technology, and then licensed it on to other players to, to make cash. And usually it's a kind of growing market because it's far easier to grab a bit of that market when the, the market is growing. So lots of spin outs in, in the digital internet kind of area at the moment. And sometimes, generally, it's sort of platform technology with lots of potential applications. Just a, a, an example of uh, the process um, that we go through. 
in terms of, of actually um, developing ideas that fall on our desk. Uh, we do something called an initial valuation, which, which is very similar to the investment pitch that, that the winners are going to have to produce. And that will guide us to sort of in which direction to go in terms of whether it needs more uh, money, whether it would be nice to sit or spin it out. Um, and usually it needs more money, and that's where the proof of concept comes in. So, move on now to the investment pitch, which is building on your, your impact pitches. <coughs> the structure is very similar to the structure of the impact pitch. Surprisingly, but it just goes into more detail around each of the sections. So normally, what we do in the first instance, of course, is, is the summary of the opportunity, and we move on to analyse the market and the competition. I'm going to talk about these in more depth in a second. And of course, once you've done your market and you've identified your competition, you then say how your technology fits in amongst that competition. And then, very importantly, you need to look at the IP and protectability which will stop other people from doing what you're doing. And then of course there's the whole business model and the value proposition, which, which I think, generally speaking, because of the time constraints of yesterday, the pitches were a little light on. That's, that's an area where I think we need to um, invest some time today with the, the big campers uh, to develop that further. Mark's here to help you do that. Then we have um, the PSD project plan. Now, clearly yesterday, it was an overview of, 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 of your, your, your idea, your impact um, idea, and there was no, no thought or talk about what you would actually do next in terms of developing um, the technology the idea uh, further. And so, certainly today, for boot campers, that's going to be an important element to sit down and decide what you'd do next, how much it costs, where, who are you going to to get the resources. And finally, there's a summary. So in terms of the, uh, the opportunity um, summary, you really need to get it over in quite a succinct way what the burning need for the product is. I mean, and this, this is really quite important because um, unless it's a burning need, honestly people won't bother with it. Um, and how the benefits of your product actually actually meet, meet that need and give some scale for what the overall opportunity is. In terms of the market and the competition, really, um, it's, it's coming back to some of the work that you've done already, so looking at the addressable market, but going on a bit further from that and actually trying now to put some meat on the bones of, of the needs of that market. What, what really are the, 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 as I say, burning, burning needs? And usually the best way to prove that is by getting some sort of third party opinion. So, you know, if you Google um, you know, some particular needs for a market, and suddenly it comes up with a whole bunch of marketing um, reports that detail mm -hmm. some detail about, about the needs, then that's fantastic because that gives you a referenceable source. So it's not you saying it, it's someone else saying it. And all of that is, is a very important part of, of the next stage. It's about, it's about putting some real meat on the bones of what you're saying, and other people saying it is usually the best way to do that. And then, sort of, what's the makeup of the market? Is there, are there spin outs being formed in this market? Is it an exciting market to be in? So, evidence that there are being spin outs and there are being exits and spin outs. Venture capitalists love that because that's kind of, well, that's, that could potentially be our, our company in the future. <laughs> and then you've done, you've done this really in some, in some sort of slightly reduced form, as far as the competition is concerned, because you're looking at your USP or your selling point and then comparing it against the competitive products. And some way to do that, we find quite useful, is to have a table where you have the competitive products downside, and you have the benefits, and you put some ticks and crosses in those boxes, and that page works quite nicely. Right, so technology solution, obviously the idea of an investment pitch isn't going to tell on the technology, but you need to give an overview, and say what the unique benefits are, what the unique features are, what the benefits are, how those benefits will meet the gaps in the market, and um, yeah, 
that's about it. And then the bit that we didn't really talk about yesterday, um, because I suppose we wanted the expertise of Peter here to come in and help you, is the intellectual property and the protectability. And this is extremely important for, for investment. Mark will be able to, to, to tell you about this, but you know, obviously investors will only put money in if they're sure that they can actually get some money out at the end. And one of the ways um, in which that can be spoiled is if someone can come in and just reverse engineer and copy what you've done and grab large parts of the market. So patent protection, IP protection, and protectability in general um, is a very important aspect of an investment pitch because it means that, that in the future you will have a monopoly over the market um, rather than investors coming in and stealing it. So another another aspect as well which we haven't spoken about is the freedom to operate search. So this is slightly different. This is when there are third parties with patents that could stop you from selling your product. So if any aspect of your product is covered by a third party patent, you would need to go to that third party to get a license. They may say no, which means that you won't be able to sell your product. So free to operate, extremely important aspect of the Sometimes I don't think value proposition and business model really we go together on the same slide, but for some historical reasons we put it on there. But anyway, they are they are different different things. The value proposition is, is why why would a customer actually buy your product? What what's the value to them? Is it save them money, is it save them time, is it to do something better? Or again, reference resources is very part of the third party agreement. Business model, this is this is about your routes to market really, mostly, I suppose. Um, yeah, um, you, you covered that in some degree yesterday. Time constraints mean that you didn't actually cover it to any degree, but you know, any, 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 any uh, substantive food. So, so today, later on this afternoon, when you've got your one-to-one -one sessions. Mark will be able to go through that in some detail and talk you through various business models, how they work, how they match to your type of product, product offering. And a commercialization plan. So this is this is really about where where are you um, with the development of this piece of technology? What is the performance of the technology at the moment? Where do you want to get to the next stage? And, and will that enable you to actually um, license the technology or spin the technology out? Where, where will you, if you hit those milestones in your product plan, your project, POC project plan, will that give you a next step? Will that enable you to license, get more money, or spin it out? And as I say, the last bullet, you know, some of the commercialization plan is looking at the steps beyond the next stage. You know, where you want to get to is a vision at some point in the future where you're selling lots of your products to lots of customers. And clearly there are going to be a number of stages in that process. And you need to be able to sort of give some confidence that you're going to get to that stage, you're going to get to that stage, and that stage. Otherwise there's no point in doing the first stage. Finally, the summary is just to sort of know a few of the key points from, from the pitch. Now let's try and bring that to life a little bit by showing you I've done this a lot showing you a, an example of So give you an example of um, a successful um, investment pitch. This, this was successful at our last um, accelerator program. Does everybody know Andrew McPherson? If you don't, you should get to know him because he's a very bright um, and good chap. And his um, technology is called touch keys, we'll talk about here, but essentially touch keys sort of tells you what it is. 
what it is is it's capacitive um, strips that go on the keys of the conventional piano, and so it can sense where you touch on the piano, and so that can be used to do to do various things. Um, and this is his pitch for some some additional funding. So, so I'm not going to pretend that I'm giving the pitch. I'm just going to let you have a quick read of what's on here, and I'll just explain what he's trying to do. In his first kind of um, slides, he's, he's talking about the, the need for the technology. So you have a piano currently, you think, it goes down. But um, you know, that's of limited use in terms of, of, of changing sound. And what you do have is a whole bunch of other instruments and that enable you to do different things with sound. So on the left hand side you've got the vibrato with the violin, um, and there's pitch bending, and there's volume and timbre. And his idea addresses that. It takes a piano and says, well actually I want to add some of those elements into, into the piano keyboard. So that's his him sort of setting out his need for the market, need, need for the, the actual um, technology. Now, people have tried this before, so he's got some competition here. Um, we've got various um, external wheels and, and other controllers to change pitch and vibrato. Um, you know, you've, got the, you've got the iPad there, but there's no, no sort of you know, the, the tactile aspect to it. So, Competitors suggesting that um, a technology or a, a product is moving in a particular direction is good. When they're as deficient as these, it's even better because, because Andrew's solution is, is so um, differentiated from these. So then he, then he adds a bit more about the actual size of the market, which is massive, but um, it's exciting enough for us. And then this, this is his, his, his way of doing it, so passive overlays, um, and then software to, to change to change the actual pitch. And the way they do it is basically there's a USB thing that comes out from his, his, his overlay keys, goes into a computer, oh, there's another USB comes out, the computer goes back into the keyboard, and when you move that, uh, you press down that, a signal sent to the computer which changes the MIDI sound and sends it back to the keyboard and it makes a different different sound for one that you just press the, uh, the key so you can start to do all number of exciting things. And he's got some great um, videos which unfortunately I can't show because I'm not in bed And he's been successful, so now, now we're saying, well, actually, there's some great validation of the need for this. He, uh, he ran a Kickstarter program, and he managed to raise £46,000 uh, um, by selling, yeah, by selling um, these kits to various people in various countries. So, extremely successful. But a um, number of Kickstarter pro projects are successful and then fail. And, and don't go any further. And Andrew wanted to, to take this, this further. Um, anyway, he talks about the IP. It is actually joint owned, which makes it quite, quite complex. So when he was at Drexel, he developed an intellectual property. Anyway, sort of all that. And he's got a number of patents, he's got a number of design rights, he's got a trademark on it. So he's got a nice software copyright, of course. So he's got a nice, a nice package of intellectual property here, which is um, which is, which is uh, good for any purchaser or investor. And then he's just going into a bit more detail about the IP. So yeah, I mean, it's not, not rocket science. You know, the business model, the business model is they want to sell it onto a Yamaha, they want to sell it onto some other kind of keyboard manufacturer who's, who already has access to the market. Integrate it into their products. 
The beauty of it is there is a kind of retrofit option at the moment. You can just overlay the keys, the, the capacitive um, material onto the keys. The bigger, the bigger plan is to get integrated into the manufacturing process. You can actually manufacture these with touch keys inside. So in terms of, of the next step, let's say, with, with the Kickstarter program, the, the idea was it goes from keyboard, out to computer, back into keyboard. Which um, is not ideal. So in terms of licensing, what he wanted to do, so in terms of improving the chances of licensing, what he wanted to do was to actually produce, get rid of the, the computer, add its firmware on the capacitor keyboard, have a connector that went directly into a touch keys ready keyboard, and there you go, Bob Jarkov. So that's the next stage of, of the, um, the program. So he's, he's highlighting a few, a few risks here as well, actually some barriers to adoption. Goes through the plan rather sensibly, if you're asking for some money, let's just, let's just break it down to the tasks that we're doing. Then let's cross it up and see how much it costs. And then finally, the summary. So, Andrew was successful. Um, the good news about this one was that um, we are now at heads of terms with a major keyboard manufacturer to actually uh, license it to them. Or some substantial uh, fees actually, so we're quite pleased about that. So, this is an example of um, a successful project where proof of concept money has enabled him to get to a stage where he can license it off at significant value to, to a third party. Um, so, I hope that in some way that has made your winners' jobs <laughs> easier this afternoon. I can always give you a copy of that so you can use that as a reference. Um, for you for, for doing your own presentations. Okay, I think that's me done. So thanks all for listening to me. I just gave you an overview of the pitch, the investment presentation. I think it's over to Mark now. So Mark, Riley, give you a round of applause.